thank you for joining me. How are you doing today? I'm doing well, Aaron. This is going to be a really special conversation. First, and just to kind of frame it up, and I appreciate you being open to how my brain works about this stuff, but there really is two different tracks to this conversation. First, it's you've built an impressive wealth management firm. And I know you're a humble individual, but you really have. And then the second is where you're taking the hard work and the legacy and the impressive firm that you have, and then adopting your next generation and committing to them from a leadership standpoint. And that's really how I got introduced to you. But I want to spend some time just first starting. Help me understand, like paint me the picture of how you started off in this industry. I know you started off as a CPA, but even before that, you you were a bit you weren't afraid to roll up your sleeves, start making some money at a young age. And then uh, my understanding is you were investing that money into stocks or different investments. Help me understand that. So I got started at a very young age. I was very entrepreneurial and always looking for opportunities. And an opportunity in the neighborhood I lived in was helping people that needed various odd jobs done, including uh, landscaping, snow removal, etc. So I started my own little business with a snow shovel and a lawnmower and had a number of uh, older folks that I took care of and helped them out. And I found that I could generate quite a bit of uh, income at the age of eight or nine uh, years old, um, helping them and helping myself earn a little bit of money. And uh, I had an interest in, from a young age, very young age, in uh, stocks at that particular point in time. And I had uh, my maternal grandmother who helped me and mentored me because she had an interest and had uh, done well investing in um, uh, stocks. So the first stocks that I bought, I think I was 10 years old, I bought WR Grace, I bought Texaco, I bought Hartford National, which was a large um, regional bank. And uh, I bought Advest, which was a brokerage uh, firm in downtown Hartford where I lived. So that's, that was my first uh, entree into uh, investing uh, in more than a, uh, a, uh, a bank account. The other thing I'll add is, Interestingly enough, uh, in elementary school, I think we were in second grade, we had milk cartons back then, little the half pint milk cartons, wax milk cartons. And um, they acquainted us with what was probably one of the most important concepts um, from an investor's standpoint, and, and that is compounding interest. Because every month the uh, banker would come in, the local banker, and open our milk box and take the coins out and post them manually with a, into a passbook and, and explain, and they'd show you, okay, well, you have a dollar and now we're gonna post six cents of interest and add the other five cents from today or whatever. And you've got an understanding of, of how uh, compounding interest works. How neat is that? And what a shame that they don't do that in schools today. I would have had a much faster head start had I been learning that. Maybe it's a maybe it's a California thing. We just don't do it in our school. I don't think they do it anywhere anymore. Yeah, what? Which is pretty disappointing. But what? That is neat. So I didn't realize, and I love the fact that your grandmother was the one that kind of helped you at ten years old start to pick out these stocks. So of those four that you end up purchasing. Did you have much of an idea? So the idea that you're buying a brokerage firm, which I think comes completely full circle for what you know your life turns into. But at 10 years old, I mean, my dad was a financial advisor. I didn't understand what a brokerage firm was. And so how much of that was grandma you're leaning on and she's able to say, okay, Earl, here are the couple things that you need to be looking at or looking for. And then obviously that probably evolved, but of those first four, how much was it her versus how much were you picking? So I did have the benefit of, uh, she had given me the name of the stockbroker she used. I think the commission charges were quite high back then, but um, her name was Mrs. Norman. She'd probably be a hundred and something years old if she was alive today. But um, so she gave me some guidance, but I bought companies I could relate to, the local bank, she worked at, at Advest, which was the brokerage firm. I 
I uh, saw the Texaco gas station around the corner and everybody was, back then they had mechanics working too, so the place was mobbed. And so I, I invested with, and WR Grace was a company that was recommended to me. So I did some of my own research. I got some guidance from the broker and um, my grandmother, who was a big fan of investing in local companies. And then to fast forward, so that's the early days of, hey, I'm snow removal and not afraid to cut somebody's lawn and make sure they, their house looks nice and presentable. But you start to go off to school and you don't become a stock picker. You start off as a CPA. Is that correct? Yeah. So what ended up happening in between is I ended up not selling my business, but finding somebody to take over my business. When I turned 16, I could work and had a union job unloading trucks. And I made a lot more money doing that than I did working mowing lawns and, and removing snow. So I did that through age 21 while I was in school. I was unloading trucks and I got into accounting because I had some neighbors that were very successful uh, CPAs. And so I kept investing. I actually had more money to invest when I was working my union job and uh, continue to invest. And then when I graduated, I went to work at Arthur Anderson, which was uh, one of the big back then eight accounting firms. And I continued to invest and I was doing some planning. I was fortunate to have a gentleman at the firm, one of the partners who was doing a lot of financial planning. This was before financial planning was really a profession. And I was lucky to be mentored by him as well as on the investment side, I worked on some of the larger portfolios that were managed by the insurance companies. This is long before uh, the mutual fund business was had, had evolved. And most of the uh, large portfolios were managed by insurance companies and separate accounts and, and the like. Not all of them, but I, I had the, the privilege of being able to work on and, and see some of the the better investments and see some of the investments that didn't work out so well. You're learning from being able to see from a little bit of a distance as to, hey, what isn't working? And then when you start managing portfolios yourself or your personal portfolio, you've already been able to see under somebody else's errors, right? Like I think there's a saying about a wise man learns from the errors of another individual, not the errors of themselves. Or you're a smart man if you work from yourself, but wise if you learn from others. Yeah, ex you're spot on with that. Yes. A lot of CPAs be grow actually pretty impressive wealth management firms, but they started off as a CPA and didn't start off as a financial advisor, financial planner. Help me understand how that bridge started to take or if that played an effect into the firm that you've built today. It had a big impact on, on the transition to a wealth management advisor. Uh, in regards to the past experience provided you with a, a very unique perspective as a CPA because you're looking at, in many cases, um, risk mitigation uh, for your clients, when, especially when it comes to positions that you take from a tax standpoint. You want to be aggressive, but you also want to work within the confines of the, the rules and the regulations. And you can also be very creative. So you learn how to balance the creativity with staying out of trouble. For, and when it comes to the wealth management business, the bridge for us, or for me in particular, was I had a lot of experience working with clients that had different backgrounds, anything from a, a, a successful doctor to a corporate executive to somebody who had built a business and understood what was important to them and understood also how to present it to them. But don't think for a second that you can flip the switch. I thought I could flip the switch from being their trusted advisor because back when I was a CPA, you could not receive any outside fees. So you were true to, truly not biased. And okay. Now, all of a sudden, you're on the wealth management or brokerage side, and they look at you differently. 
rules or regulations may have been different. Did you have to drop your CPA license or were you able to maintain that? No, but you couldn't hold yourself out. You could still carry your CPA. But maybe you, you weren't able to market the same way no. that you would have had you just been one channel or the other. Now, and what was kind of what was the ethos behind that move? Like what was, so you were obviously interested in investing from the age of 10, you started making money eight or nine, started investing at 10, but have these neighbors that are successful CPAs see that and say, hey, I'm pretty good at you know being an entrepreneur and figuring out how to make money. I want to live the lifestyle that they might have, or I want to be able to go on the trips that they get to go on. So that starts to bridge, you become a CPA. Now you get in your brokerage, like what was the ethos behind getting your brokerage license? Was it, I want to be able to more holistically, do you see that there was meat on the table that, hey, I'm not able to fully service my clients. Let me get my brokerage license. Help me understand that. It was exactly what, you, what you're referring to. And that is to be able to really um, provide the clients with the appropriate level of service because as a CPA, you were limited, number one. Number two, you got credit for nothing. You would bring in an outside um, uh, insurance person. You would bring in an outside broker to execute the asset strategy that you develop for the client. And yeah. so I saw that as a real opportunity um, to uh, A, provide the client with a higher level of service as well as to take responsibility for the decisions um, that uh, were being made and also to earn uh, a better living and have a more, have more um, control over, over my success. Yeah. Have more skin in the game. You weren't leaving. It wasn't, okay, I understand how to play the roles of these other players on the field, but I'm limited to my seat at the table. It's, is there a way? So in preparing for this interview, I want to do as much research as I could. And so my understanding was your vision at the beginning of launching yourself in this industry was you wanted to make sure that clients felt comfortable knowing that you were going to take a holistic approach. You weren't the stockbroker. You weren't the CPA. You weren't just the financial planner. It was, I want to take care of your entire balance sheet and help you from an estate planning standpoint so we can check all the different levers and make sure that they're able to function in their best interest. Help me understand that vision. And at, for a younger advisor, how were clients adopting your, or your vision on the early days? Important thing for me was for any client to be able to live life to the fullest. And in order to do that, it was really important to, to develop a plan. And back then, most advisors were managing the money. And then the plan, in many cases, was done on the back of an envelope. It was secondary. It wasn't comprehensive management. So it was important for me to develop this comprehensive management um, for, for clients. And that was the, the objective was for them to be able to look at us as, as like their personal um, CFO. But in a holistic way, we were trying to free them up and give them as much time as possible because you can't buy time. You can buy a lot of other things, but you can't buy quality time. Which is extremely important. So how does, and that's, I think, so we're, we're at about 1985. And so we'll start to segue into LPL, but during those days, being a quote unquote financial advisor, you, a lot of the people in our industry really were just stockbrokers. And they really, at the end of the day, were just salespeople. What you were saying is, um, sure, I understand stocks and sure, I may be able to sell, but I'm going to, my niche is I want to work with people that prioritize their time, that want to make the best interest or make the best decisions for themselves. And it's not limited to just taxes or stocks. It's we're taking a more comprehensive approach to how we serve our clients. And that was your vision. When people, when you would get in front of individuals that you wanted to work with, were they adopting that vision? Because that wasn't the norm. Like I said, the majority of them are just salespeople in our industry. So you're you're differentiating yourself for sure. 
at that point, it was very early on, um, and we were starting to prepare for, for a fee-based business. But in 1985, it was very unusual um, for us to be doing what we were doing. We were, we were really disruptors. I was really a disruptor. Uh, yeah. In terms of the vision, where I saw what I wanted to do uh, is, is, and, and help people directly and have an impact on their lives, not just on their, their portfolios. So it was absolutely, they, they were not prepared for um, what we offered. And I will tell you that it was a struggle. The transition was a struggle. Because it was completely new. Like nobody, they were used to being able to be sold here. We own all the information, us at the wirehouse, we, we know all of it. You didn't have Google. You didn't have all these things at your fingertips. Earl's over here saying, oh, wait, no, I want to I want to help you. I'll be fully transparent. I want to take care of everything because my the way that I'm going to be compensated, the way that I'm going to structure this relationship is not limited to a commission. And then the next time I need to make my car insurance payment, I'll call you back up because I, I need to get paid again. No, it's, hey, I'm taking care of everything. I love that and I love the idea. And, and I think that that speaks to, yes, you were an early adopter to a business model that really didn't exist. You were disrupting a, a sales industry. I don't even want to say an advice industry, a sales industry. And that's been able to, that is why your firm is the way that your firm, the, the growth and the success you've had today. So as we look at 1985, there is another disruptor in, in the marketplace, a man named Todd Robinson that just bought a company called Linsco, not even private ledger yet, bought a company called Linsco, 1985, he's 28 years old. So I am, you, you're from Boston, there's a lot of rich history from our country in Boston. I'm not a big historian, but I love business and I love the history of LPL being somebody that's been around LPL since I was five or six years old. So I've tracked it very well. And as I start to look, well, this other disruptor in Boston joins LPL. Help me understand what that was like and how Todd Robinson, you're a young buck, he's a young buck, really starting to reinvent how for him, how advisors and how brokers, really brokers at that time, for you, how end clients worked with advisors and brokers. So Todd Robinson in our family is held in the highest regard. I met Todd about a year before he bought Linsco. I believe it was out of an estate. <clears throat> and Todd was, a, Todd is an amazing individual and he told us about his vision for Linsco. And this was in 1984. And so this was before I really got started in the um, wealth management slash brokerage business as it was called back then. And I decided I wanted to be aligned and on the same path that Todd Robinson was on. So how old would you have been then? Sorry to interrupt, but just to help frame it up in my head. Oh, so in 1984, I was 30 years old. So let me take a step back for a second. It, I met my wife who came from Sweden in 1981 and convinced her to stay here. It's my girlfriend at the time. And she went to school here. And so between 1981 and 84, we worked together. She worked part-time, but she went to school full-time. I worked full-time at uh, PwC. And I helped her because English was her second language. She was a former um, national team ski racer for, for Sweden, and German was her second language, and English was British English. So she had a very difficult time in school. So I typed her papers, and I helped her. I took freshman English. It was my second time. She got an A. I think I got a C when I took it the first time. But the point is that um, 
I was working and I knew that I wanted to leave accounting, but it was difficult because of the economics of funds that I would, earnings that I, 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 I had a very good salary. I was doing well. I had to support two people. But at a certain point in June of 1984, before I met Todd, I made the determination, for better or worse, that I, I had to quit and really focus in on how I could align myself for the future to work in the wealth management brokerage business. So I quit. Okay. And her family came over to meet me. It was the second time. Uh, we were getting married in August. And they're like, what does Earl do, Maria? What is he doing? He has no job. Wait a second, let me understand this. So you're getting married to a, somebody in the United States. Your whole family's from Sweden and he doesn't have a job and you've got an upcoming wedding and you can only imagine the questions there. I'm still not their favorite person. But um, that was the only way I was gonna be able to spend the time to meet people like Todd Robinson. And I'm very fortunate because I met Todd Robinson that summer. What a, what a wild, so that is neat because you both very much have different mindsets. We're visionary and you're thinking as, Hey, here is the status quo or here is the norm. You, you're just, your in clients were different from him. It was, I want to take all these brokers and help them ha have independence Earl is saying, I want to take all of these end clients. I've been serving them. I understand the accounting scene. I'm very familiar with stocks because I've been doing it for 20 years now. Um, and I want to be able to reimagine what their experience is on how they operate and function with a firm like mine. I think that that is wild. So 1985, you join LPL and you're running with this vision. Where does, and I know you have a good relationship with Jim Putnam, the chairman of LPL's board. Where does Jim come into play here? So things are working on all cylinders with Todd. Things are going great. And I'm realizing, so this is like 1988. And I'm realizing I could, once again, I could see it's so important. We have to move to a fee-based only platform. And I was close with Todd. It was a small firm back then. And um, we talked about it. We said, we're working on it. And then I believe it was 1989 and Linsco merged or bought a uh, private ledger. And that's when Jim Putnam came on board. Jim Putnam was a private ledger. And when I first met Jim, Jim was so charismatic. And he's such a, he's just such a great ally. If, if, if you can um, get close with Jim, he's wonderful. And he tries, and he, he was so supportive of everybody at the firm when he came on board, but he's a special individual. And between Todd and Jim, which was 1989, we were in a situation where we couldn't have had um, better, better leaders, but they weren't ready to run a fee-based platform. So I actually left with my brother and we went to Schwab. Okay. Because they had just started, I believe it was called the FES program, which was a fee-based program. And I didn't want to leave. And I kept in touch with, with Todd and Jim and, um, Jim called up one day and he said, hey, we hired this, this gentleman named Mark Lopez, who was also a wonderful, um, wonderful um, leader uh, on the ad uh, advisory side. And he said, we should get together with, with Mark Lopez because he's, he's going to run this advisory platform. So I remember uh, meeting Jim and Todd. And then we came back, I think it was 1991 or 92. So there was a, maybe a two year absence from, from what became uh, LPL financial. And that's not really known information. I, in speaking, so Mark had made the connection between the two of us and I'm 
Mark, I get, he, Mark's like an older brother to me. And so I'm ta- talking to Mark. I'm like, this is kind of wild. Like it is right where Earl started his career in the brokerage business or wealth management business. We keep having to dance between the two and they're different, but the same channel. Um, as, as Earl's starting off, this is when Robinson is buying uh, Lensco. And then you start to see the segue of these two companies. And I just think it's the neatest thing. And so Mark knows he has to deal with me getting excited about certain stuff. But that is gets me excited thinking about Max and Lucas being young guys in this industry, myself being a young individual in this industry, and thinking that, well, when Earl and Todd and Jim were all starting off, you all weren't 55 years old starting your firms. It was, hey, we were bootstrapping things at in our you know mid twenties, early thirties, as we were getting things set up, help me understand. So Todd or so Jim calls you up. We just brought in. Uh, you're at Schwab. Jim calls you up and says, "Hey Earl, we miss you. Let's start to talk. We're starting to get ready to adopting a fee based model. Where were you at in size at that point? Oh, uh, in terms of assets, we were we were we were small because we what we had to do was. You were forced to be on the brokerage side. And then when we moved over to Schwab, we went fee-based. So we almost kind of had to start again. And so we were, we, we, we were very small, but um, don't hold me to this, but within a couple of years, I think we were in the top three or four in terms of assets under management in what was called the SAM program, Strategic Asset Management Program. Might have been one at, at one point, but um, it, it took a while for um, a lot of folks to embrace working on a fee basis only. From a end client standpoint, so your clients, because the end consumer had only been used to my broker calls me, sells me a stock, receives a commission. You're saying, oh, wait, wait, I want to sit on the same side of the table. So is that who you're saying it took a while for them to adopt this new relationship yes. structure? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And where did you start to see? So your vision is unique. You have two running mates in LPL that are saying, okay, Earl, come back. When did you start to see the business really start to, the end consumer, your client base, really start to adopt Earl's our partner. He's not our he's not our salesman. Earl's our partner. And when did you start to see? Did you have a niche that you started to work with? Or was it that no, we just we we sold a different story. We sold that we were partners. It was a ladder. We sold we had to sell them that we were partners. And um, it took some time. It was it was it was painful. It was quite painful. Uh, it didn't happen because you didn't have the industry supporting you. You had the brokerage firms or the wirehouses that did things very differently. And so you had to tell the story over and over and over again. And so it took three or four years to really start to get some momentum. Uh, We were kind of the black uh, sheep at the conference in terms of the people that were on the advisory side, they would have these wonderful educational um, conferences. And the, the wire, excuse me, the um, um, uh, wholesalers would have all these wonderful events for um, people that were on the brokerage side. And on the advisory side, we're kind of left to our own because they, we weren't helping the, the, um, the wholesalers and Mark Lopez and Jim Putnam made sure that we, we were taken care of and had dinners. And some, at one point when we got started, I think there were maybe 10 or 15 of us. And that obviously yeah. grew as, 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 as uh, the industry embraced working on a fee basis. I would imagine at that time, a lot of the mutual funds exchange trade funds really weren't a thing, but a lot of the mutual funds, a lot of the structured products, well, they were all brokerage based. And you're saying, no, I'm, we're doing a completely different. And that's what I like is, and I don't want to knock other advisors. I'm not in the business of knocking other individuals, but 
Even to this day, there are advisors that base their decisions based off their relationship with their wholesaler and the baseball games they get to go to or the nice stakes that they get to have. Not so much, I'm going to hyper-focus on what's in the best interest of my clients. I'm going to adopt this fiduciary model. They're saying, I'm still comfortable with routing business this person. I do think that it's important to understand a company's investment philosophy to be able to use that in portfolios, but not base all of your decisions only on one because of the benefits you get for working with them. So you were at the early days, you're saying, I, I will, I will sideline the nice steak dinner at the national conference to make sure that we're adopting this unique business model that you fully believed in was going to be the future. Thanks to the leadership of Todd and Jim and their vis visions. Um, they, they deserve so much credit, not just for building Linsco Private Ledger and LPL Financial the way they did, but also changing the industry. Well, I can tell you this. Um, within an arm's reach of you, there's several beneficiaries of them, and that being your two sons and myself, because that's really my when my dad was in this industry, went from so his was different. His was the I think the more natural progression went from insurance to the wealth management space. Whereas you went from accounting to the wealth management space and yeah started off it was a lot of brokerage business on the insurance side to saying okay he's at these industry conferences speaking with advisors like yourself or other top advisors learning them talk about oh no we have sam and we have this advisory model and this is where you're putting yourself on the same side of the table as your clients my dad just being intrigued by that and then adopting that business model for himself on the independent side they led the charge and we're you know I'm a massive beneficiary of it. So unique leaders. And that's the really one of the big reasons why I went to go work for LPL for two and a half years between my firm and working with my parents. So we are at a point where clients are starting to adopt. Let's go to your owning success across the industry. People are, uh, clients and clients are starting to see, okay, this business model is a thing. Were they referring other friends and family saying, Earl's our partner, Earl's not our, our salesman? Like, help me understand what that referral source looked like. Yeah, the, it was strictly, we did, I've never made a cold call in my life. Um, and I got, actually, I'm kind of proud of it, but uh, it was strictly referral and it was referral from CPAs that we knew in our network. We did a lot of um, continuing education presentations because CPAs need X amount of credits. And uh, so we use that network to meet clients as well as our existing clients. We worked on a referral basis only. So we did not do seminars for outside, um, outside our, our, our um, client circle. So we strictly worked with clients, family members, their friends, loved ones, and referrals from CPAs and attorneys. So that's interesting. So part of my business model, I just stood up, I grew up in a little town outside of Fresno in California, small town, 20,000 people, farm town. And I launched an office in San Diego. And as a part of the business model is doing workshops on a regular basis, but I'm marketing to outside sources. You're saying, Tick it up one notch, market to or connect. And it sounds like you probably already had an existing market being that you were a CPA. Put yourself in a position where we'll, we're, we are going to feed the source or the, the center of influence for a much larger, larger audience, and they'll just refer business back our way. I, I think that that's a very sound you know, growth model. And we were able to do that, fortunately, because we had the credentials. Um, I, in particular, had eight years of experience in the profession, and we had a lot of connections within uh, with other professionals, and there was a trust factor there. The hard part was we trust you preparing tax returns, providing tax advice, provided finan providing financial planning advice. But what do you know about portfolio management? Well, do they know that Earl was buying stocks when he was 10 years old? I couldn't disclose everything with all the compliance uh, 
rules and regulations even back then. Understood. So let's start to let's start to segue. So you've built an impressive business. I think at this Thank point, but uh, and even the business wasn't where the segue. But at this point and today, you're at about one little north of one point eight billion dollars under management. Have a team of over 25, 28 employees or stakeholders. Impressive. But and you, you've been on this track of building along the way. It wasn't something that happened overnight. You said when Jim called you, you had to reinvent your entire you know business structure because now you can start to do advisory business or fee-based business. In 2010 to 2012, your boys are they're out of school, they're working. How important did you want? So you have two sons. How important was it for was the original plan, okay, I want my kids to come work in the business? And they're like, Dad, let us have some experience elsewhere. Like, help me understand how that all worked to the point that they now were really running or calling a lot of the shots for your company. If you were in the same situation that you got dragged when you were um, quite young to LPL conferences. And um, so you were acquainted with Jim Putnam, who Todd Robinson was, and the other. Um, uh, leaders of, of LPL Financial. Um, so they grew up in the business, whether they liked it or not. We talked about it. Um, it was a family business. We talked about it at breakfast, at lunch, at dinner. Um, and they saw what was, what, how involved uh, I was in, in, in clients' lives. I never intended for them to get into the business. They were high level athletes. They were ski racers. They went away. They were following in their mother's footsteps. Basically, she was a very high level athlete, as I said, um, on the Swedish uh, national downhill ski team. And so when they were 13 years old, they went to a ski specific academy Stratton Mountain School, it's a phenomenal job on the academic side too. So they were gone and they weren't home a lot. Um, but when they were home, they would always try to help me out. And Lucas in particular, actually when he was 15 years old, wrote and put together our first website, which was pretty early on. He spent the summer, he knew how to program um, or code. And he, he wrote the whole thing himself. And uh, he, we got a lot of positive feedback on that. He was more involved uh, than Max was. Um, but the point is, I never expected them to get into the business. Now you fast forward a few years, and they are in college. And unfortunately, uh, their mother, my wife, got diagnosed with breast cancer metastatic breast cancer, unfortunately. And we were always a close family, even though they didn't live at home uh, during the school year. And they really rallied to, as a family, of course. And we did whatever we possibly could, the three, the three of us, uh, for Maria, which meant moving up to Boston because we were living in Hartford at the time. And we moved up to Boston and Max was going to school in Boston and Lucas was at University of New Hampshire, which is only an hour away. So they got to spend even more time with us. And I think what ended up happening was Lucas in particular felt like he really had to help me. He's the younger of the two. He's two years younger. Max is, two, is, is, is the older one. And um, Lucas, right out of college, came to help me because he knew how important it was to provide as much support as possible. Max had already gone to work for Sun Life in an executive management program, which was a phenomenal program and was getting experience as a younger person that is very, very hard to get. So Lucas actually convinced Max 
when his program was ending and he would have been placed, and he had an unbelievable opportunity to be placed in the reinsurance side in Chicago, which was a coveted job for anybody of any age. Lucas convinced Max because his, their dream was always to work together. Now was the op opportune time to, to um, come into the family business. So uh, hopefully that answers your, it's, that's a long answer, but it, it wasn't mm -hmm. as simple as it might have, might seem. Well, so for our audience purpose, the, the way I was introduced to you was you're on a panel talking about bringing in the next generation at LPL's focus in, I think, 2015 or 2016, one of those in Boston. And I was very impressed with your sons. And I'm a number of years younger than them, but I was very impressed with their ability to be able to articulate what the vision was for the organization. And I did not know the backstory or the, the more intimate family story as to why they were Lucas was feeling a calling to saying, hey, I need to help dad out. Dad's going to need to take care of mom. I need to be able to help dad. And then what I like is how close they are. And they they have a unique bond that not all brothers have and all brothers should have. And so to be able to say, hey, Max, this is our opportunity. I'm curious, and you may have talked to them about this since, Though you never intended them on them ever joining the business, had they ever talked about it or thought about it? Maybe you might not even know that. There's probably a 50-50 chance that I didn't know about it. Um, Lucas actually had a, they were both entrepreneurial. They had things on the side. Lucas actually had a DJ business um, and he was doing quite well. Um, house, playing house music. Uh, and uh, he do gigs in college and um, actually, when he was in Boston and working uh, for me initially, he was still doing that on the side because he loved doing it. And he had some opportunities. Uh, Max had a lot of different opportunities, too. And he, Max actually was very interested in cars and was making quite a bit of money in um, um, buying and selling cars. They take after you in that aspect, entrepreneurial from a young age. There were always a couple of steps ahead of me. So, uh, no, I don't. I, it's a 50-50 um, chance that they had talked about entering into the family business. But what really made the difference is when we got to spend all that time together um, caring for, uh, for, for Maria. Yeah. With everything going on and starting to bring your sons into the firm, how was, how did clients respond to that initially? Uh, as we start to frame up, okay, Max and Lucas, they're still young, but they're coming into the firm. They're working with you. What was the messaging to clients and how did clients initially respond? Clients loved it. They, okay. they loved it for a couple of reasons. They loved it because they realized that we were uh, at that point, a smaller firm, that there was key man risk between my brother and myself. Uh, we had some other wonderful employees but there were a lot of, of other firms back then that were already working on their exit strategy. Uh, and their exit strategy typically was uh, to move on and their, the family business got um, um, absorbed by other larger entities, et cetera. And so the clients loved it because they knew that we were going to continue the legacy with our family of taking care of them. In addition, the fact that we were multi-generational, that my sons could relate to their younger family members was very important to them. And also a different perspective than I or my brother might have had or some of the older um, members of our team had. And so it was embraced in a very, very positive way. So much, in fact, that, or, that they were asked early on to speak at various conferences to talk about what it's like to work with um, within a family business and to grow up 
within a family business and why they decided to work with their father and their uncle. Um, so it, 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 it's been amazing and they've taken the firm to the next level and I'm just so proud and excited and um, Maria, if she was here today, would be just absolutely thrilled to see um, yeah. the way they've, they've grown into amazing human beings and, 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 and leaders of our company. Going back to that's my introduction to you was LPO recognized their ability to be leaders, their ability to be what you were in 1985 to 1989, a visionary in an industry. That is what they are of this generation. And so in that vein, let's talk a little bit more about because clients have full confidence that Earl is going to be able to take care of the relationship from a grandma and grandpa or mom and dad standpoint. But now it's Max and Lucas are going to be able to resonate well. Not that Max and Lucas can't help serve grandma and grandpa or mom and dad, but Max and Lucas are going to be really strong being able to connect with our next generation, help bridge what dad's built an impressive business. A lot of the stuff that your family is going through, a lot of not just the transfer of value, but also the values that you've instilled in your two sons, they're able to kind of segue a lot of those conversations to clients, the same as what they're working on at home. I think the other big advantage they had was um, not just working with the, our clients next gen, but also when they were known entities to, um, to our clients because they grew up going to client events. Um, they were very, always very uh, personable. And I talked about my sons all the time and they'd say, well, you know what? We've got this event coming up, bring Max and Lucas. So interestingly enough, most of the clients, not all of them, but enjoy working with them and ask for them. Uh, and we work as a team. So we have our planning department. We have our um, portfolio management department. We have our, and, and, and we provide comprehensive wealth management. And Max and Lucas sit in on many of the older clients' relationships because both sides enjoy it. Um, so with the younger generation, we've been able to, with the clients uh, next gen, we've been able to introduce them, uh, especially over the last few years when they start working and Max and Lucas and some of our younger advisors are the ones who manage those client relationships. Got it. I think that that is so interesting being that you weren't even when they were young going and being exposed to these different things, you weren't necessarily forcing your hand. And I do think that there is a lot of advisors that want their next generation to join the business, but they're kind of forcing their hand. You said, Hey, I, I am proud of my, my, my boys and I want them to be a part of what my life and the things that I'm doing, the things that I'm building. So it was a very organic introduction. Clients just automatically liked them because they were good, respectful individuals. Clients liked them. And so now it's, hey, things are changing and we're going to bring the boys into the business. It became a very easy adoption for those clients because they'd already seen it because likely you built a large part of your lifestyle into the business and you made yourself, hey, if you're taking care of them comprehensively, they're not just seeing you every time you need to, you know, you know, a new sales pitch. I think that that is super special. One thing that I do want for our audience to, to note, my introduction to you and your sons was at that point, I believe that Max was CEO of your company. And knowing that maybe at that point, you guys were well over a billion in assets, probably about 1.5 in, in assets. You built an inc impressive client base and firm. I'm thinking this young individual is a CEO. His, you know, his dad fully has nothing but trust in him. And you kind of stopped me in our initial conversation. And said, "Yeah, but Theron, you don't understand. They've been around. This has been their entire life. 
they've been around this their entire life. They were going to focus at the LPL's national conference before it was even focused from a very young age. They were getting access to Todd Robinson, to Jim Putnam, to some of these very, very important individual and very smart individuals. They're getting access. Whether the original plan was to bring them in to the business or not, they're here and they adopted a lot of what the business model is early and they're able to take off what the vision is for this next generation, making sure that the legacy stays intact. Yeah, it's so Max was the CEO when he was 28 and Lucas was the COO when he was 26. And one could look at that and go, what these are young guys, they don't have experience. Todd Robinson, when he bought Linskill, was 28 years old. So I remind myself of that and other people who would say things. Um, it's not age, it's, it's really, as we know in today's world with all these startup companies that young entrepreneurs and visionaries um, are, are being able to provide new services, disruptions in old industries. It's really the vision that someone has and, and also the, the drive, the passion, the port, whatever that happens to be. It's not always financial. Um, the mentorship. And that's really how our society today is able to really um, improve a lot of the products and services. It's not by, with few exceptions, um, us older um, established folks coming up with, with, with these ideas and suggestions and the leadership and the ability for, uh, for in particular Max and Lucas to provide the direction. Um, the culture is, is hugely important. Um, the focus in on improving the client experience and not staying with the status quo is huge. So they have come in with their ideas, and in some cases we've had to rein them in a little bit, but not when it comes to the passion and the um, enthusiasm and the culture building and the work ethic that you, you know, you, you can't, that's kind of uh, part of their DNA, I, I, I guess. Um, and they take after, I will tell you that they take after their mother in all of those respects. Um, and they're fortunate to be where they are today in terms of their, uh, their achievements. Um, a lot has to do with the way she, that, uh, um, they call the, the, the background that they had, um, uh, being able to spend a lot of time in Europe and see how things uh, work over there in culturally, uh, how the economy functions. Um, they're dual citizens. They spoke Swedish first, uh, so English was their second language. So they're also very familiar with uh, challenges in, in, in how to present concepts so that their um, people can understand them and and, and, and be able to uh, to be able to uh, digest what we're telling them that is very interesting I did not know that that is definitely I don't want to say an advantage it is an advantage I don't want to I think that that is very unique and I think that that is going to be extremely special from a client standpoint before we start to wrap things up, and I really appreciate the time that you're spending with me, help me understand that Max was 28, Lucas is 26, CEO, COO. What was, what was the ethos or what was the reasoning behind that decision? And how long did it take for you to just say, nope, that we need to make this happen? Did you lean on other mentors or friends and ask, or was it gut feeling? What were your, what, what was that process like? And then how did the boys respond? 
it was totally gut feeling and my brother bought into it. And um, I just go back to Todd Robinson at 28 years old and the visions and the leadership that he provided and the success that um, he was able to achieve, not just for Linsco Private Ledger, LPL Financial, but for those of us that were able to align ourselves with them. And so to me, it was a very easy decision knowing everything I knew, uh, obviously intimately about the capabilities that Max and Lucas uh, had. So that was, um, that was very easy. That was, th those were easy decisions, as well as understanding how important back then the technology was becoming in our business. And without the technology, you really can't provide the type of client experience that, that our firm and firms like ours provide. And they understood the technology extremely well and how to bring people into the business to help build the technology and reinvest. And that was the tough part, was we reinvest and we continue to reinvest in our business, predominantly in technology, which drives the client experience and makes it more efficient for not just those of us at Winthrop Wealth, but our clients as well. And I believe it brings to life the client experience. It's not only, so you, early adopter, 89, 88, or 85, 89, putting yourself in a position that you had a different vision. You wanted to do everything from a comprehensive standpoint than what everybody else was. Now, Max and Lucas, Lucas standing up the firm's first website at 15 years old, really is able to say, hey, we've been taking care of all segments of your estate, but we're going to flip on the switch so you can see it at two o'clock in the morning while you're laying in bed thinking about different stuff and then shoot us an email the next morning. We're going to be able to see the same thing that you're looking at because not only did we make this investment 12 years ago, we're making this investment constantly and we're aligning ourselves with very sharp individuals. I think that that is extremely important and I think it's going to be a game changer, continue to be a game changer as the boys can lead and grow in this industry and certainly the firm. Two points to that. Number one, LPL has been an amazing partner. So they drive a lot of the technology. We drive a different type of technology for the, cl for the clients, but they integrate. They've been a, a, an amazing partner. Um, as well as listening to what we need and helping us with what we need because they know other firms need it. Uh, and Lucas and Max never leave, leave it alone. They're always looking for better solutions, more efficient solutions, and that's their DNA. They're always looking to Im improve the client experience as well as our internal experience with, with, with our, our colleagues and stakeholders. I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I would imagine it's a lot of that competitive athlete DNA. Just continue to advance, 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 execute, execute, execute. And what's going to be the next thing? This was great four years ago, but our clients need to, we need to be leading the charge. I think that's extremely important and very impressive. The other thing I, I want to add too is how important it is for our family to be as supportive as we possibly can for those that are less fortunate um, and philanthropy is at the top of our list and we do whatever we possibly can with our money and our time to help some specific causes because you can't help any, uh, you can't help uh, all. And at the top of our list 
is, is women's breast cancer. And we're very involved at different levels in fundraising, in contributing our time and our money to do whatever we can to hopefully cure as well as provide better treatments for those women that are diagnosed with breast cancer. And that's something as I, you know, preparing for this conversation, I could see what different organizations you were affiliated with. And I know that that is something that hits extremely close to home. And I think that your first statement is there isn't, there are people that are going to experience what your family experience, but maybe don't have as many or as, as many resources to be able to say, we're going to move into the big city to make sure that we're as close to the doctors and to the care that we need for our family. And Earl, I mean, I just have to, as an individual, as somebody that looks up to you, that admires the firm that you've built, but certainly the legacy that you're leaving in your sons, thank you for the work that you were doing and the example that you're leading is I'm a young, ambitious individual that wants to build an impressive firm like yours to see what you're doing, not just from a business standpoint and not just for your family's legacy, but also for other families that may experience what your family had to go through. Um, and say, you know, how can we take the hard work that we've been able to accumulate and build upon and be able to share that with others? I think is extremely noble and something that other advisors or other people in the same situation need to be able to note and share the same. So thank you. Earl, we, we spent a lot of time on legacy, and I think that that is one of the most impressive things is you've adopted your next generation into your business. In my business, I, I work with a lot of families on their legacies. Or in my other business, I work with a lot of families on their legacies. I want to know, what is your legacy going to be on wealth management? The industry that's given so much to myself, so much to Max, so much to Lucas, what is going to be your legacy or what do you want for your legacy to be on this industry? That's a complex question, but I'll try to answer it um, in a simple way. That we... We did the best possible job for helping families achieve their financial dreams. If, if we can do that, as well as spread the word how important it is to give back to those that are, are in need, but it's not just financial need. Mentoring this includes mentoring those that might have fallen in difficult times or just need help. And I think I personally will feel like I made a difference in a few people's lives. Well. My hope is from this conversation, you're going to make a difference in a lot of people's lives. I know you've made a massive impact in your boys' lives and in the lives of your stakeholders and clients, and you sure have made an impact on mine. And I'm very grateful for you to take the time to spend with me. You did not need to do this, and um, this really means a lot to me.